Simple Life ought to be described with words like celebrative, celebrative, however you pronounce that, or Eucharistic living, instead of, instead of feeling that it's uh, confined and a great poverty, uh, let's open it up into the fullness that it is. Uh, in, in the Old Testament, there, the prophet Hosea said, you shall eat and eat and not be satisfied. That was a curse. It's this excess and this insatiable appetites. That's the, that's the uh, unfree life. I think what we're talking about are words like more freeing, more celebrative, and more Eucharistic or, or thanksgiving. If you never know when you have enough, you never know when to say thanks. Proverbs says, give me neither poverty nor riches, but feed me with that which is needful for me, lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God, or lest I be rich and say, who needs the Lord? I don't think there's freedom either in poverty or in too much. That's why we're talking about sufficiency. That's, that's the freeing. You're not, you're not addicted to things and you're not spending all of your time trying to find enough to live. There's nothing freeing about either of those. But our culture very easily sees there's no freedom in poverty, but we tend not to see that there's also no freedom in affluence that's gone overboard. Some time ago, Jurgen Listener, who was with, with the Lutheran World Federation, had 10 reasons for simplifying your lifestyle, and we've condensed them into four issues because it's easier for me to remember them. One is a faith issue. To me, that means that I need to trust that Jesus, what Jesus said, that our needs will be met. And even when Jesus talked about how rich God's blessings are for us, he talked about the image of a bushel basket shaken down and overflowing. And I think our problem is that when our basket gets full, we go with an even bigger and bigger basket and say, well, God, you filled up this first little basket. Let's see what you can do with this bigger one. So we never know what enough is, and we have to decide that for ourselves. So the faith issue to me says, I can trust that God is always going to supply my needs. The second issue is a, a freedom issue. It is not freeing to feel addicted to stuff. Ernst Becker said it very well when he said, we drink or drug ourselves into oblivion, or we go shopping, which is the same thing. It is not freeing to have to always try to be accumulating more and more when we could be desiring less and less, and then realizing that you have to protect it, or clean it, or shine it, or store it, all these other things that, that we don't like doing. The third reason is sharing and solidarity. I know that if I change my lifestyle, it's probably going to not change a lot in the world. But it gives me a sense that my brothers and sisters who have so much less than I do, that I am in solidarity with them. There is no reason why 6% of us in this country need to consume 30 to 35% of the world's resources. And the fourth reason is a witness. Again, it's what Peter said about being able to speak to the hope that is within you. I don't do that very well because my lifestyle looks like everybody else's. I wish that I could get to the point where my lifestyle wasn't one of poverty, but was one of sufficiency, and that I joyfully lived that way so that people came up and say, gosh, you don't have a lot of this world's goods, or I don't, your car looks pretty crummy, or why are you dressed in those clothes? But but I could give the reasons why I want to live more simply and why those things shouldn't be so important to us. If you look at the person of Jesus and the way Jesus chose to, to live his life when he was here, the way he chose to interact with people and not possessions, um, that's our role model. And it's a good model. It's one that has um, my best interest in mind. It has the world's best interest in mind because Jesus loves us. So I can trust his lifestyle, I can trust his teachings to, um, to be good. One of the reasons that I was brought into some of the simplicity changes after she led the way was because my son was born about six years ago and he was born with a birth problem, a physical problem, and I had been used to having an older car or a, or a toaster and just throwing it away and not fixing it and making do. And suddenly I had this little body that didn't quite work right and we had to do therapy with him twice a day and to, to help it uh, work right. And I learned something that we need to do better with what we're given, 
have better stewardship with what we're given and uh, make do. And, and, and I was ready for more of the lifestyle changes then, I think. We had a realtor once who, as we moved into our, our new smaller house, was real blunt and said, why did you buy such a small house? And we tried to explain about the reasons wanting to downsize. And, and uh, he said, well, my wife and I don't have any kids. And we, we bought this huge house with a million dollar loan and, and uh, was trying to impress us. And so I said, well, why did you buy such a big house? And he said, because I can. And in those three words, he summarized what has made the American dream an American heresy that people get as much as they can because they can. And one of the chapters in our book is called Because We Can, that we can downsize, we can live simpler lives. Why? Just because we can. I've had a chance to just do some of any and everything that I wanted to do, but at the same time, that sense of fulfillment was not there. That the, 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 the things, I mean, it turns into what Tracy Chapman talks about in her album, just mountains of things. Um, they, don't, they don't mean anything, and I think as soon as people get to that realization that things don't mean nothing, uh, you can get on with your life and, and really make meaningful contributions in terms of interacting with other people, in terms of giving back to your community, to your neighborhood, to your government, um, in terms of really having a quality life with your family, instilling some type of values that don't depend on material things to make them real. If we define the individual in relation to community, being in a community itself is job, is work, is fun. Whereas if you are individual, how do you keep yourself going? You better do something, otherwise you are lost, you are alone, your life becomes meaningless. I think the individualism of our community does affect the way we see ourselves. When I think of the older people in India, when they are not doing anything, they have retired, they don't have a job to do, they are sitting at home, but just being with other people is living, living fully, living abundantly. I think that perception of being with others itself as a way of defining yourself does help. If you are left alone as an individual, how do you look at yourself? You can look at yourself only in the things you do, not just being there. I'm not being tied to a department store. I'm not having an intimate relationship with a department store or with a credit card company. Um, I think maybe perhaps before that was like my God, it was where my power came from, my self-esteem came from things I had and the power. I have a $2,000 limit, I can use it. And um, I'm, I'm enough myself and I don't have to have things and purchase things to have some kind of power. I, I'm more powerful just as my own person. To try to live more simply is going to be in a direct collision course with our culture because Sufficiency as a justice lifestyle is not what the capitalistic system demands. If, if we can't have more needs so that we buy more things, our system isn't going to work. Uh, someone that is very content reading, visiting with neighbors, uh, sexually very happy, enjoys their family, and doesn't spend a dime, uh, they're not going to be very good for the capitalistic system. So I think there is always the subtle push to consume and to consume and to consume more stuff. It doesn't feel weird to me as a Christian to be anti-materialistic. It feels weird to me in the society in which I am living. Uh, it's a very subtle seduction. And I think it look, you feel very strange because you're out of step. Uh, you hear a different drummer, you want to go down a different path. And there is a subtle seduction of the American churches and of American Christians in general. What I see going on in the culture is, was described by Thomas Merton when he left New York City and went to a Trappist monastery in Kentucky. He said, I'm going to leave the world of manufactured needs that are met with manufactured goods. I, I think that we have created what are essentially luxuries and made them into needs so that we really do have uh, 
our satisfaction and our well-being in consumerism, in materialism. A quote from Schreibmacher, a German theologian, uh, we don't lie in the bosom of the universe. We are running around. We need to lie in the bosom of the universe. There is fun in simply being in this universe. Isn't it fun just to be here, looking at these trees, these birds, the clouds, the sky? There is simple beauty in being. If we can recover that and not define ourselves by what I'm doing, what I'm achieving, there is fun and beauty in simply being a part of this universe, this beautiful universe.